Running Sentences presents Ghost Sands Part 4 Welcome and unwelcomed guests. Things are starting to get strange as people settled in on some answers. Much of this knowledge leads to stuff that is better left alone now. This story is written and narrated by Michael Henry. It is a work of fiction. Any names, characters, businesses, events, and situations within this story are products of the author's imagination. Any resemblance to real people, situations, characters, businesses, events, and or fictional businesses, characters, events, and so on is purely coincidental. Copyright 2024, Michael Henry. All rights reserved. The officer kindly led Judy into the office lobby, where a tired-looking man sat half asleep at his motel desk. The jingle of the bell above the door did not disturb them, watching the infomercials on the TV set in the corner of the room. Excuse me. Oh, do you two lovebirds need to check in for the night? The clerk said this without taking a moment to look over at them, and had like groped for some sort of book that was on the desk. Once retrieved, it was put on the counter and opened before them. If that's what you're here for, then this is the book you want to keep things quiet and off the record for. Uh, we still, of course, need records and money for services, but uh, other than that, you, know, you freaks go be freaky. Excuse me. The clerk with the name Tag Clerk finally turned to see them to glare at them since they weren't getting the message. Oh, I see police officer with that badge out. Uh, if you're doing a dirty deed with her, you still need to sign the book under whatever false names you want to give. I don't want to know any more than I have to. Officer Douglas marched up to the desk and slapped his hand onto it. I'm here because this lady is part of an investigation and needs a place for the night, if you don't mind. That's what the last cop said. I think it was someone from out of state, so yeah, whatever. Anyway, sign in the book and pay for the night. Anything else doesn't matter to me. With a tap of the book from Clark, the officer took it up and began filling out some information, uh, showing Ralph slash Judy where to sign. It took him a few minutes for the three of them to circle around back to the parking lot of the camp. Bart and Laura said their goodbyes to Claire and stood by their car, watching her go back into the main cabin. Well, that was a dead end here. So what now, Miss Leader of our group? Well, we could try and track down the uh, one responsible for the kidnappings on this side. You mean, uh, Zevian. That's his name, right? Uh, do you have any idea where he might be? Because unless we have that, it would be a silly to try and search for him in a vast state like this one. She smiled and opened the door to the car. I happen to know where the prison he was staying at isn't too far away. So you think he's close by and you think he's staying in this area? Where do you think he went to? Home. Where else would one go to? Is the place still in his name? She nodded yes as they got into the car. A moment later, Bart had gotten the engine started up and some warm air going. It wasn't typically cold during these months, but lately it had gone that way as they got comfortable. He began to put the car into drive to get them to the move. It is still in his name. No one, not even the bank, wanted to touch the place. The families of the kidnapped kids couldn't pin it on him, so they couldn't get restitution, like seizing the house. Um, so should we go there now, then? Or wait for the morning? What do you want to do? He might already be up to no good. If the demons who used him before want to use him again, yeah, that might be a possibility. The car was now out on the road, and Bart made sure that the lights were on. He played with the switch a bit to make sure that he knew which were the high beams and which were the low. Is there any chance that they won't? Uh, yeah, there's a possibility demons just don't care anymore. The connection to his soul might not be as strong as it once was, and if they believe that, then they might search out someone else to get them across. But they probably still use the house, right? Since that was the connection spot? If I have that correctly, or... And I do have more questions about all of this, though. Why would the demons stop? Once Zevian was captured. 
they have an easy in and out of portal between the worlds if the connection is strong there. And I guess it could be from what I saw. I'm not totally sure. It was a weird place. As for why they stopped, that I cannot say. But I hazard a guess that they figured that people might destroy the connection if things kept happening. And what is this possible connection? You didn't really explain that, did you? A physical thing or the house itself? What do you mean? It could be physical or the house. We'd have to tear the place apart to find out which it is, and I didn't really get a strong sense of where it could be. Time slipped by as they decided to head for their hotel a few towns over. The thin walls alerted Zevian to the fact that someone was next door to him. They were coming in at a rather late hour as he groggily looked towards the clock and the bedside table. He hadn't intended to fall asleep atop the covers, but that is where he found himself as he listened to the conversation next door. Are you all set then? Oh yes, I think I can survive for the night. Are you coming for me tomorrow or something? Uh, we might. Uh, you should stay here for the week and uh, we will tell you when it's safe to return home. I am to stay here and that is all I have to do? Yes, unless you happen to need something or some company. Um, then that, that is all I have to offer at the moment. There was a bit of small silence that followed as a bit of shuffling and then the door closed. This left Zevian wondering what had happened over there and the feeling that he should go meet his neighbor, but it could wait as he got under the covers of his bed and went back to sleep. Entering the cavern to Malfast's place, Book paused for a moment to collect himself. The darkness kept things at a distance and the slug of Malfast was hidden away. Are you there, Lord? A shift of the shadows made itself known, coming a bit closer to where Book was. What brings you back here? Work at the mine has stopped, and I was trying to find where Ralph had gone off to. I've returned from your assignment. I sent you on no assignment. Uh, yes, you did. There was a moment as the face of Malthus was now right in front of Book, large eyes blinking their yellow glare that peered into the mind. They were almost the size of Book. Are you working with someone else? I will destroy you if that is the case. There was a crack of thunder which shook the cave. No, 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 it was your orders and your presence that told me what to do. I was just outside the mine. A sudden force pushed and grappled at Book, slamming him in, into the wall next to the door he'd just come through. The heaviness was enough to push the air out of him with a squeak, and he spent more than a few minutes trying to collect himself. Are you saying that someone else told you to do this? Well, my guess is another demon has learned your plan, and uh, there, there was uh, someone on Earth meeting with your former possession, I believe. Oh, uh, that I do not know. I assumed it was you, since that's what you've been after this whole time, a way to break through to Earth. You are useless. I am not. I've always done what you've asked me to and then some. But now that we know about them, we can plan and capture this demon. Send me to find them and I will bring them to you. There was a grunt from Malthus. You expect me to go along with that because you said a few nice words? If some other demon is on to you and thinks it has a shot to cut you out of this place, do we have a choice? Another grunt, this one dismissive of what he was being told. Work on the mine and I will consider it. Go. Book gave a deep bow and then hurried away. The door was soon shut and Malthus waited a few minutes before muttering. You will be watched, rat. You already knew that. Spitting to the side, he then moved back towards the sidewall, where he had his own private project going on. He'd been carving into it with the hopes of reaching the ground where the worlds were softest. A little more and I won't need this stupid pack of useless fools. They couldn't find their way out of this sand in the first place. Why every demon thinks this is the only way across is beyond me, the fools. The soft sandy rock began trembling as he clawed at it with all his might. 
A full night's rest had not been what Zevian needed. He awoke with a head full of questions and no answers. As a result, he remembered that there was someone next door that had come in late, and maybe it was with some demon or something. They could provide some answers as to what he was to do now. So he'd gone and stood outside his door to the motel room and waited. They might eventually come out, and then they could talk, couldn't they? An hour or two passed before the door opened, and out stepped Judy, who jumped in surprise at seeing him. He turned and offered a smile to her. M- my apologies for scaring you. I'm only out here getting some fresh air. Oh, I didn't think that anyone else was at this motel. The worker last night made it sound like it was a place where people only come to play and then leave before the morning. I wouldn't know anything about that. My reservations were made by somebody else and I just checked in and that was that. But I did hear you come in last night, thanks to the walls not being all that great. Are you having some sort of trouble with uh, your friend? Me? A little old me having a problem? Ralph, who was in Judy's body, realized a moment later that indeed things were supposed to be wrong. But he wasn't really presenting that at the moment. Uh, that, that is not the way it sounded last night. You had someone bring you here. Why? Oh, um, it's... Ah, uh, well, um, I don't know how to talk about it yet. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I, I was going to get some ice from the machine. You don't have an ice bucket. Judy looked down on her hands and then back up with a smile. Oh, would you look at that? I... I plum forgot it, if you'll excuse me. The woman turned and headed back into her room, and then shut the door, hard. There was definitely the sound of the lock being thrown as well that Zevian just caught the slightest bit of. He was sure that this meant that the lady was unlikely to be the one he wanted for information. But who was it, then? He turned to look at the sparse parking lot in time to see a sleek-looking black car pull in and come to a soft rumble before him. It didn't look like the car of Mr., though, so who was this? The window rolled down, and a man, bright and cheery, looking, poked his head out of it. Good morning. Hello. Would you happen to be searching for God? At the moment, no, sir. I happen to know of one who will change your world. I have enough problems with my world and other worldly creatures, so thank you, but no. They seem to think I'm some sort of helper, which I'm not. The man opened the door to the car and bound right out of it. In a rush that surprised Zevian, the man was now right beside him. Is that the case? How sad for you. My name is Lark Great, by the way. All around helper to the needy and the damned. I don't think you understand my problems or me. Uh, Excuse me. With a move, he tried to head back to his motel room door, only to find this Lark standing in front of him. There was a strange glow to his eyes that he couldn't help but look towards. Who did you do the kidnapping for? One was, I believe, called Mr. The Other, Malfast the Destroyer. He tried shutting his eyes and not thinking, but it was sort of just coming out. He had not intended to say this and or that and struggled to blink and think. For a moment, Zevian felt things clear, but a look back at the red eyes made him fall back in a state of nothingness. Good. Now you know what to do. And this motel room will be the base of your reparations, okay? Go forth and begin retrieving lost girls and boys. Yeah, yes, as you wish. Ralph, worried that the stranger next door was trying to do something, kept by the window to his room to check it out. He glanced out after a few moments and saw that the man was now standing with another figure. His heightened sense gave off a dark feeling of an atmosphere that seemed to be surrounding this new stranger. A sort of demonic look to him, which wasn't good. Malfast nor Book were supposed to make an appearance here, and what if the motel neighbor was his in this world? He had been dropped off in the area around where the kidnappings had happened, so... 
Maybe he was supposed to be hunting the hunters to make sure that they didn't capture the connection? Or maybe not. It was all confusing, and he wasn't used to things on this side of the planes of existence. Think, think, communicate. I can talk to Melfast, can't I? Realizing this, he hurried Judy's body over to the desk where the phone was. It was an old rotary one, which was the best type for this call. He picked up the receiver and listened to the voice that came over the line. Please understand, by using the phone, you are giving us permission to bill you for its use. Calls lasting more than two minutes will be charged at a rate of two dollars a minute. Anything before that will be a dollar a minute. Is this understood? Dial one for yes, two for no. His finger found the number and began circling around until it went to its proper place and then let go. Understood. Please dial your number. There was a quick rummaging of twenty-some-odd numbers going round and round. Then a wait for a moment as the rotary dial would make its way back to its starting point. A line would eventually pick up with a busy little tune. And then a voice. Yes, who is this? Uh, it's Ralph, your associate on Earth. Oh, what have you been doing with your time? Have you done your job yet? I've, I've been doing my job, but I am a bit lost. It seems I've come across another demon in your area, potentially. Really? I've heard rumors about such things. But that is not your mission, is it? No, but it feels like something is going on, and they might be going after your connection. So one should pay attention, right? And from what I can hear from their conversation, it is a person who has some sort of connection to you. You heard that? How, without being noticed? Well, this body I've taken has good hearing, uh, combined with my demonic abilities. Well, it's, it isn't a challenge to catch a thing or two. I see. Is that all you've learned, then? And, you know, tell me more, I suppose. Well, this is a person who's known as Zevian, and he talked to a mister who led him here. He doesn't seem to know much, though, about what he's done previously, but I did catch your name. And what of the demon's name? What was that? Lark, but it is probably a cover. I don't know any demons by that name, so the, yeah, that seems true. It is for the best, probably, since I don't need distractions. I will get someone else to look into such situations. You stay on your mission to get rid of the human interloper, not the demonic one. There was a pause for a moment, as Ralph was afraid that the phone was about to be hung up. Uh, before you go, um, could you, perhaps... Point me in a direction towards this villain ruining all of your plans on this earth. There was no response at first, and fearing that the line had been hung up, Ralph coughed. Hello, uh, you still there, Overlord? Malfast, Demon Lord? Yes, I am. I'm just thinking of a way to answer you. And no, I don't know how to go finding them. So it's all on your own. It's your job. And if you fail, well, you know what hells await you. The line did now fall dead with a busy signal, and then clicked off altogether. Slowly, Ralph hung up the phone and made Judy bite her lip in worry. What to do about all of this? Bart and Laura had found a local diner not far from their little hotel after a night's rest. Both were sitting in relative silence as they looked over the meals that they'd ordered. What do you want to do now, aside from visit the man's house again, I guess? That's about as far as I thought about it. Uh, why, do you have something you wish to do or explore, and can you explain a bit further about the other demons you said might be lurking about? He took a piece of bacon from his plate and bit into it and began using it to point out things on his plate. Well, demons are like humans. They're split into their own little groups and factions. He divided the space between his pancakes, the maple syrup area, and hash browns, and the remaining slices of bacon. Sometimes they will work together for the greater good, other times they all work on their own projects for the lords of demons or whoever they find themselves under. Mostly, they're all trying to be the ones that get to cross over to this plane. Why do they want to get away from where they are so much? He nodded and took another bite of the bacon. 
It's a place of vast sand dunes and little else to keep one company. And the sun never sets on it, by the way. The only place one can get some peace and quiet is in the tunnels that get dug into the dunes and they're used to cross over if they successfully manage to find a weak spot. At some point, one demon has managed to dig deep enough and accidentally crossed over, and this may have happened around the time that uh, Jesus Christ was doing a thing, or maybe it was a bit earlier. Anyway, that set off a whole expedition. She sat back, not wanting to say anything at the moment, and leaving her plate mostly untouched. Her eyebrows were knit as she tried to figure out something. It is all oh, rather silly if you ask me. I didn't ask you if you thought it was silly, Bart. It does raise another question for me, though. You. He nodded with a gleam in his eye as she appeared and she was now putting things together. How am I even here if I'm supposed to be some sort of demonic-like creature? He added the last part as a waitress came by and filled their cups with fresh round of coffee. It earned him an odd stare, but the waitress moved on quickly. Well, how are you here? Deals made by others for whatever reason they dreamed up. Our boss made a deal with some demon. I don't know them. And thus I am here because they signed me over. And no, I have not possessed some human body. And I have no choice in the matter of who I am. And also, that sounds terrible, but uh, where would you like to go today? Well... Actually, not to the house, but I've heard of a town not far from here. A little city of a place. It's got some sort of connection to at least one of the factions, who I know of, who have creatures on this side, and they're trying to get through. They have possessed people and operate a business out there. Her eyebrows shot up at this news and then leaned forward. Demons operating businesses? For what purpose? How can they do so without raising suspicion that something is weird about them and manage to stick around? Can demons stick I mean, can demons stick around? I know you stick around, but you seem to be a weird case. Well, they can stay here as long as they have contracts with humans. It has to be a deal with humans, and it has to be rock solid. The rumors I've heard is that unless they outnumber the humans, they aren't allowed to stay here without approval. Don't know why, don't really care who gives the approval or who decides all of this, I do not know. Fully enraptured by this conversation, she sipped at her coffee and occasionally took a bite to eat. She was also doing a lot of nodding as well, just to make sure that he kept talking. As for why uh, they have a job and are going through the day-to-day -day malaise of humanity, again, all I've heard is rumors. But it is like the house. A connection point to other plans of existence and they want to control it and use it for their purposes so they shut it down to everybody else but themselves and try and look like normal humans so appearances to make things look good i see well shall we go to the house and see if anything is going on there or if you can find a connection between the worlds I mean, I'm ready to go. As for finding the connection, it's possible. But if I didn't find anything in the first sweep, it isn't going to be an easy task. Laura had already begun the process of sliding out of the booth while dropping some money on the table. It is better to look again than to just assume that it can't be found. He joined her, getting out of the booth and headed for the door. They were under the careful and suspicious watch of the waitress as they exited. With great care and to make sure he was unnoticed, Malfas exited his tunnel via side entrance he'd managed to build. Getting away from the others certainly has its advantage when one needed to see other demons. He'd made his way out of the dark safety to the bleached red sand dunes that sparkled the reddish tint. There were many holes in the dunes around this area, which were mine shafts and other explorations by demons and so on, and they all led towards a giant hill with a flat spot at the top where one could meet. There had to be a reason, though, for seeking a meeting, as a ghastly dragon-like creature circled the skies above, keeping things quiet amongst demons so that no fighting would happen. 
The instant Malthus poked his head out of his side cave, the creature landed before him. What do you seek? Information, Mr. Quarter. From who? I seek information about the greater area of New England. The dragon cocked its head to the side, trying to decipher and figure out what this could mean. You must be clearer in your request. I seek any creature that has access to that area or has been digging around it. Why do you seek this? They're intruding on my turf. There was a curt nod, and the dragon was gone, leaving him alone to proceed up to the top of the dune. A task he did not want to do in this sweltering heat out here, but he started up and out. The top of the dune wasn't much, flattened with a long table placed on top of it. Chairs and barrels acting as chairs were all around this place, and Malfess sat down on the nearest seat he could find and began to wait. Ten minutes went by before five slugs began to show up and circled around, taking up odd chairs here and there. What have we done to be called here for? Yes, what is this? I was busy with my work. I don't need others coming and interrupting all the great work I've done. The two sniveling misfits are always asking questions when you can already see why we're here. Who was here before us? Malfaz was for some reason. So what is it this time? You lose your way again? Interference on my turf. That's always going on and you haven't done much with your section of land anyway. Why should we honor your deals when you have done nothing, when you have nothing to show for your work? Malfas offered a growl as he crawled up onto the table to make sure that they were all paying attention to him. That doesn't matter. I have important work and now it is compromised because one of you or many of our type have decided they are more important than sticking to agreements. We have those things for a reason. One of the ones which had been quiet offered a polite applause, which caused them all to look over towards it. Well, this is, sounds fascinating to hear and think about, but it is all just word. Do you have any proof, Malfaz? I have workers in the field who are running across signs that the area was tampered with. I never understood why that is such a big deal. Because, Louis, if too many demons are coming through in an area, it draws scrutiny, which is why, which is exactly what has happened. I was in possession, and now I can't possess because people, these flimsy humans, are now looking at my area because somebody's working on it. A cough interrupted Malfast from going any further, and he looked to the lone demon who had not yet talked. You have no evidence with you, and you have called us here to yell at us. This is a waste of everyone's time. Yes, I came to yell at you and warn the lot of you off from trying anything else. I will expel those found on my turf, as I am crossing over soon. With one last glare at the group, the demon Malfas turned and began hurrying his way back to his hole in the, in the dunes. The group had gotten the message, but Malfast worried they actually hadn't gotten it at all. They would just continue to do what they do. But this work was precarious and it didn't need the extra problems with demons, although they were just going to do what they were going to do, so he would just have to expel them when the time came. Standing once again before the home of Zevian, the duo of Laura and Bart stood on the front lawn the overgrown grass coming up to their knees as they began the walk towards the front door. What's our hope with this place? You find the source of power that has provided a strong connection between the worlds, and then we cut it and the job is actually done. It is good to see that you know at least some of the stuff that is going on. I have questions in my mind why the boss sent you on this job when you seem to know so little. Wow, how kind of you to assume shit about me. And yes, I know a thing or two about what is going on, and I wanted to make sure that you did too. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this 
type of job. I'm surprised you didn't figure out all of this sooner. I've repeatedly shown you I know things about this case. My apologies, my apologies for not thinking about such things sooner. He proceeded towards the front door, not wasting any more time. His senses made him look it over, and trying to look at something. There was the faintest of dark scents into the air, leading almost to the sky. That, he knew, should be impossible, since there was no connections of the demonic side of things up there, unless someone had struck a deal. What is it? You're staring towards the roof and the sky. Well, uh, there is a sense uh, I didn't have before that something on the upper side of the house. I don't know what or where it is, but something is connecting two worlds. It does feel like it shouldn't be there, though. Of course it feels like it shouldn't be there. It's probably some cursed item, and, and that always gives off weird vibes. No, I meant that it's odd that it's going upwards instead of downward. Demons use the ground to get here, not air. She caught up to him as they were now walking through the front door of the place. Her hand grabbed at his arm to stop him from going further. If you could explain a little bit further, please. Much like demons, there are those in the sky that would like to come down and take over from here. Angels. Some call them that, I suppose. I call them annoying gnats. Anyway, since the ground is close to sand and most soil contains some sand, it makes a good connection for demons and they use that. The cursed item, as you put it, should be closer to the ground than towards the sky. Someone upstairs is helping out someone downstairs, then? Potentially, or another group is playing a long game to get what they want, instead of really actually cooperating. But until we find the object, it might be hard to tell which way it goes. How small can this thing be, by the way? It can be as big as a house, or as small as a pouch filled with sand. If it is a whole house, then would it matter if it was up close to the sky? I don't know. It can generally be as big as it wants. Usually it won't be. That is, unless one can really hide things well. But, um, I'm not getting a sense that it is the whole house. So shall we go see what we can find? She went in first with a shake of her head. The long walk by Zevian, away from the motel, brought him to a park. A simple little place in the center of some town. He hadn't paid the remote piece of attention to where he was, just that his home was not far, far away from here. In a robotic motion, he moved to the wooded section of this park, his eyes locked on to the little picnic that was being set up by a woman with two kids and a third one that was sitting just off to the edge. The whole thing was not far off from a little crop of trees where he now stood and had made his way over to. It was not terribly hard to hear the conversation that was going on. Oh, you two, please put the plates on the blanket, not on the grass. But how will the ants eat if we don't have a plate set on the grass? Silly coral, the ants don't eat. Yes, they do, Lewis. They eat quite a lot. Do they? Yes, they do. Henry, come over here and help us out. You don't have to be sad about missing out on some things. Yes, I do. Very well. The motherly-like figure turned back to the other two, who were mostly making a mess of helping out. They seemed to be having a lovely time of whatever it is they were doing, but Xevian was, was more focused in on the mopey kid, who had their arms crossed and glared at the happiness. Not waiting a moment longer and feeling the need to draw this lost little one in, Zevian moved closer, hanging just by the woods and out of sight. Henry? The boy turned and looked towards him. Who are you? A friend who can help you do what you seek. You have other things you'd rather be doing, right? Henry rose from his position, still closely holding his arms across his chest. His family, or the people taking care of him, didn't seem to notice this. But, to make sure of that, Zevian snapped his fingers as a dome-like black see-through sphere suddenly surrounded him and Henry. Why or how he'd not do this was a nagging thought in his mind, 
but it was only there for a moment, and he felt confident with this sphere around him. What is it you would like to do, Henry? Watch TV? A simple enough thing. Some cartoon was no doubt on the kid's mind. Zevian stepped out from the, behind the grove of trees. I know of a place where you can do that. My parents told me never to trust strangers, though. Uh, strangers are very scary things, and you don't want to come across them. You're a stranger promising me things. I was told I can't trust that. Oh, no, you shouldn't. No, no. It would be a bad thing to trust strangers. The boy, who looked to be all of seven or eight years old, began to pull away and take a step back. There was a gruff stare from the kid. Do you know what they say to say to strangers? No, I don't. What do they tell you to say? In a quick motion, the kid had charged forward as Zevian was kneeling down to get to eye level. Henry's foot came up, smacking hard in Zev's groin. Pain shot through him as he tried to keep upright, but found that sitting down felt like a much better option. I told you I don't trust strangers. You play dirty, and that's great. That's the kind of thing we need. Who is we? My friends and I are looking for kids to help them out on a special project that only they can do. And what is this project? Oh, it's a chance to save the world. To be a hero by watching TV, it's really simple. The boy withdrew further, scampering a bit away, but came to a sudden stop. His hands flew out in front of him, feeling for what it was that had stopped his forward momentum. Hey, what is this? Mom, this weird man is bothering me. She didn't respond as Henry began to pound on the invisible wall. You're already helping me out, Mr. Henry. You don't know it, but you must come with me. Mom, help me. She doesn't know you exist anymore. All she cares about is what is in front of her. You can see it as clear as day. Her attention is only on those that she loves. Mom! End of part four of Ghost Sands. Thank you for listening.